This is the part I'm most nervous about. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, wonderful, okay. So great, well thank you guys so much for having me here today and um, I, I know that a lot of you are probably in this class because you're interested in travel and working in lots of different communities. Some of you have had a chance to do that um, to, you know, to different levels. So today I'm going to talk about our project in Nepal, which you um, may have had time to read a few of the materials that I sent. And one thing I think is kind of interesting to think about is that this is a project that I co-founded with no background at all in public health, um, dentistry. And one of the things that maybe we can jam about a little bit today is just in general, as you embark upon your, your public health career and your career in dentistry. Actually, let me just ask, is everybody here a dental student? So how many, can I just get a, a sense who we have from public health and dentistry? Um, my name is uh, Tamarin deberry Godin. I'm a pediatric dentist and I run a public health program uh, that's based at NYU's College of Dentistry and that provides uh, outreach and care to vulnerable populations in New York City. I'm Great. also a member of the global team. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, Laura Tamarinda was actually in Pokero with us um, for a couple of days, and then she moved on to Circuit uh, during our last program there. Okay, great. And then Thank you, you have um, Marissa and Becca, Eddie, and I uh, from the admin team. Hi, guys. And everybody else are third-year dental students. Okay. There may be one other person joining us who is a general um, faculty member. Uh, I invited her. She ha I don't see her yet, but she may pop in, um, and she's one of our general dentists and a faculty member who's worked in public health and who's been uh, also was in Pokero with us this last trip. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, so lots of people coming with some amount of clinical orientation, and I'm sure a lot of different perspectives that I, I look forward to hearing about. And uh, you know, again, like I think one of the things we can back up and think about and that I hope to be able to talk with you guys about today is just taking a step back and thinking, what kind of expertise and skills do I bring to a problem, to any problem? And what does my training and my background say about my orientation to that problem? And how does that fit in, um, you know, with other perspectives? What do I have to offer that I might not have expected? but also where my blind spots and my biases based on, um, sometimes based on my own expertise. It's that old adage that, you know, when you have a hammer, sometimes everything can look like a nail. So um, specifically today, I wanna start about talking about this from three different perspectives. And you guys obviously um, are in the School of Dentistry. So for those of you who are in dental school, just, Tell me what you're learning about. And Eddie suggested it might work well to send these this in by chat. Um, but like, don't think too hard about it, just the obvious stuff. Like, what are your classes about? What do you do all day? What are the kind of main things that you're learning as a dental student? Okay. And Laura, are you able to see the chat? Yeah, I figured okay. it out. So clinical procedures. Anyone else? How to diagnose and treat disease. Um, so focused on the basic science, sciences, clinical procedures, practice-oriented guidance, patient care, how to interact with patients. So we're talking about things on the patient level. Okay. We're gonna just kind of take this one step further and organize our thoughts a little bit. So specifically, if you were gonna think about the theoretical and scientific framework that your clinical training is focused on, the definition of disease, skills involved, and methods of alleviating disease. So you guys have already said some of them here. How do you think this boils down, um, starting with a theoretical and scientific framework? 
what's your main framework that you're working with? Should I give a hint? I'm gonna go with kind of the biosciences, biology, cariology, um, physiology, let's generally say um, a bioscientific framework. We'll just organize this a little bit in here. So what kind of skills do you use? And you guys can type your answers to some of these too. So what, what skill set are you getting in dental school? I just gave away all the answers. So when I say, I said restorative care, but I didn't go to dental school. So yes, no, thumbs up, thumbs down. Do you guys agree that um, the skills involved largely have to do with clinical procedures and working on the patient level? So yes, so we're thinking about individual people. Often we're thinking specifically about the mouth. The definition of disease is a, path a pathology on the biologic level. With the tooth. So in kind of colloquial terms, like informal terms, we, from a clinical perspective, we, did, we would define disease as dental caries, and we're really thinking about the individual experience of disease. So what if we were going to try to kind of map out these same things around public health? What do, what do you think the theoretic and scientific frameworks are in the field of public health that are slightly different from clinical? And you can just, yeah, implementation of ideas. What else? You could pick any of these categories. Skills involved, implied definition of disease. Just what comes to mind when I say public health? What are the methods of trying to reduce disease in the, from a public health vantage point? Prevention, so very prevention-based, public, the policy level the community level, yep. So we're now we're thinking more macro. We're thinking about big data and epidemiology in terms of skills involved and the implied definition of disease. We might wanna think about things like resource constraints. So this is kind of how I've mapped this out is at the theoretic level, instead of thinking just about the no, I shouldn't say just about, but the difference being thinking kind of about the biosciences, we're thinking about population level, epidemiolo epidemiologic processes, social processes. Um, you might, if you're in public health, be working with big data sets, thinking about behavioral sciences. When we think about implied definition of disease, it's saying, well, there's not enough resources or there's environmental risk factors. There's widespread health behavior issues. You know, we got to tell people to exercise more and eat right and have public messaging and, um, you know, various other public problems that kind of lead to disease at a population level. So we're thinking more about the social environment and we're interacting more in terms of the methods of alleviating disease might be going and trying to pass a new policy or develop public messaging or create better infrastructure. So this is what we often may talk about more in the realm of the social experience of disease or the social determinants of health. Um, and this isn't meant to be all encompassing. It's meant to kind of say, with a clinical perspective, we're over on this continent. And with a public health perspective, we're kind of generally over, you know, moving from, from east to south to north to west. These things are obviously gonna have overlap and interact with each other. Okay, now we get to my favorite one. So let's, who's gonna be brave and take a shot in the dark? Um, what comes to mind when I say social justice? And you can, we don't have to go kind of box by box, but just thinking about those things on the left-hand side. Um, who wants to take a shot at just typing some things that should go in this list as far as what theoretical orientation comes with a social justice vantage point? Okay, issues of equity, access to care. So thinking about who gets to benefit 
um, ensuring there's a level of fairness in society. What skills do you think that we might use to be able to impact the social justice angle? Legal and political skills, definitely. So um, advocacy, legal, legal skills, political skills are going to be some of the methods that we're going to use. Um, we're, we're looking for political and cultural change with social justice. So it's going to involve, involve those skills. Certainly research. And research is interesting because all of these are going to need research, but you know, bio, research in the biosciences may be very different than research on social justice questions. The theoretical framework may be different. Leadership and advocacy, great. So this is the way that I've kind of broken this down. This is where we get into talking about human rights, racism, oppression, um, all forms of discrimination. Uh, you guys are probably familiar, you've heard the word intersectional theories, which has to do with kind of the way that different forms of oppression interact with each other. So, you know, if you live in a poor neighborhood or in a poor country, that's a, a risk factor. But if you're a woman living in that situation, that's two risk factors. Um, we can bring race into that equation. We can bring history into that equation. That's intersectional theories talk about those things. The skills, as you guys said yourselves, um, would be around advocacy, community organizing, legal strategies. I think the implied definition of disease is really important here. And I hope it's something that you guys can kind of be making mental notes about when I'm describing our approach in Nepal. So this is where we say, you know, part of the, the issue is lack of self-determination. It's political and cultural influences. It's the way that society keeps people from being real, you know, fully realized and having agency over their lives. That's ultimately why they don't get good health, not just why they don't have good health, why they don't get good health care. Um, so this has to do with cultural and political change as kind of the, the general lens that we would take on trying to change health status or address health problems. So this is what I would call the institutional experience. But I would probably spell it right if I wrote it again. But anyway, you guys get the idea. Um, so I, I shared one article with you on structural violence. There's a ton of literature on structural violence, but it's essentially the idea that when our institutions are unequitably designed, when there are forms of, of oppression built into them, then that leads to suffering and ill health um, in substantive ways in the lives of everyday people. So this could be if I kind of just, you know, printed this out and laminated it, I could keep it in my wallet as a <laughs> short guide reference. Um, but I want us to like loosen it up a little. So I've written the same thing in kind of more, you know, just a more relaxed way because this isn't meant to be hard and fast. The idea here is really to be aware that these different persp perspectives exist and to make sure that if you're carrying a hammer, you don't end up with everything looking like a nail. So in a second, I'm gonna start talking about our project. And I, I wanna challenge you guys to think dynamically about like why do people in Nepal have poor oral health? So we're working on oral health, but is it because they aren't brushed, like just because they're not brushing their teeth? Is that a good way of framing the issue? Is that a complete way of framing the issue? Is it because they can't see a dentist? Uh, if you have the opportunity to visit that community, and I'm going to talk about Nepal because that's a community that I know, but um, you know, if you have the opportunity to work in a community that you haven't been in before, then which of these levels are you working at? And what are the implications of that? And uh, we, we need all of them. All of these things are important. It's not that one's better than the other, but if we're not conscious of kind of where we fall in these different categories, then, you know, without realizing it, we can find that um, we're kind of working over here in the, the clinical realm, but maybe reinforcing some of the things that are going on in the realm of structural violence, because we haven't kind of thought about how our role fits in to that system. So, Maybe before I go for it, I'm going to talk about our project. 
Does anybody have any questions about this so far? Nope, good to go. Okay. So let's switch over to Nepal. Um, I will briefly kind of explain a little bit about how I got started in Nepal. This is a picture of my second home in Kaski Kot. A couple of you guys have gotten to come here and visit my favorite place in the world. So um, I first went to Nepal just after I graduated from college and uh, I went on kind of a volunteer program and I was actually there to be a teacher. And in the process, I was just really interested in kind of being a part of everyday life. So I lived with a local family and I just really like wanted to do all the things and hang out with people and plant things and carry things on my head. And um, I picked up the language relatively quickly at that stage. I don't really know why, but um, somehow that worked out well. And I lived in this house, uh, which is not a very big house. It's smaller actually than it looks in that picture. And it was interesting because people would come by with like all different kinds of things that they wanted to ask me about. I'm old, so this was in 2002. So no cell phones, no Facebook. There was no telephone in this village. For those of you guys who've been there, it's amazingly easy to get to now on a paved road in half an hour, 45 minutes. At that time, it took about three hours on this like crazy, bumpy bus ride um, on these switchbacks on like a washed out road. So um, anyhow, I just, it was an opportunity for me to interact with people in the community. So at this stage, I had just graduated from undergrad. I was 22 and my degree was in anthropology and neuroscience, <laughs> like liberal arts. Um, but I, I did become kind of like a listener of random problems and just learned about the experiences that people were having. And I was constantly being approached by people with toothaches. And so originally I just thought, well, I'm interested to understand more of what's going on because when somebody comes to you in that acute pain syndrome moment, you feel like you wanna do something. And it was kind of unclear what that should be. And so I, I learned more about the issue at that time and discovered this was a really, really big problem in Nepal. And I just started organizing with teachers who I knew there. Um, this is actually the, my co-founder. Um, I'm his co-founder, <laughs> Govinda. And um, in the beginning, we did a lot of what you see in this picture. This is the school where I taught. So we kind of started off with the simple, obvious things of doing some oral health education, trying to find people to come and provide services, um, trying to get some training for the local healthcare provider. And then there was a lot of stuff that just went badly and didn't work at all and caused a lot of drama. And I'm gonna spare you all, all of those painful stories. And we're just gonna skip right ahead to where we are today after having spent a good bit of time on trial and error in this program. So. For those of you who did have a chance to see the video link, you will have heard some of this, but I'm just going to run through it again. Um, the health, just in terms of the way the healthcare system in Nepal is designed, it's quite centralized. You have um, the health ministry in the capital, then there are regional hospitals at the district level. So there's 75 districts in Nepal that gives you about a sense of the size of a district. And then at the rural level, there's something called a health post, or if it's really small, then they call it a sub health post. So that's the main place where somebody living in a place like Kasky Coat, particularly at that time, would go for primary health care. And this entire system is staffed by government health care providers employed by the government. And at the time, I've done this presentation many times, that number 30 <laughs> continues to stay the same over many years. Um, there just really isn't any dentistry built into that system. And to the extent that it has been, it's mostly concentrated in a couple of regional hospitals at that second level there where it says regional district hospital. So if you're living in a village, I mean, you're in a good shape if you're three and a half hour bus ride from a big city like Pokhara where we're based. For a lot of people, it's much further than that. Um, there are now, I think, 14 dental hygienists in the government system, but the point is there's very little dental care. 
And at the health post level, at the primary care level, where women go for prenatal checkups, where you go if you caught your finger, um, where you go if you have a fever and you're trying to decide what to do next, there is nothing there with regards to dental care or oral health care of any kind. Um, what you would be most likely to get at a health post is antibiotics for painkiller. Um, and even then, there's not necessarily a lot of training for healthcare workers around oral health, dental health. It's kind of like, oh, you have pain, here's, here's um, an antibiotic. So as I move into talking about what we did in the system, this is, uh, I'm a social worker. My background is in now, is formal training is in social work. And um, this is a quote that I really like from a practice model called structural social work. And it talks about the difference between compensating and caring for victims of oppression as compared to transforming the rules and processes that lead to the conditions that cause people to be sick and to suffer. So we can talk more about this kind of thing. This is one model that if this kind of stuff interests you, you could look into and I could provide resources, but I think it's a nice touch point um, in following this arc from the community level where we started with one clueless foreigner and a bunch of, you know, committed teachers um, through this kind of bureaucratic government system and up until the model that we have now. So I'm going to describe how this looks in 2020. So the first thing is at that health post level, um, we have a dental clinic and the dental clinic focuses only on the procedures in the basic package of oral care, which originally included only ART, which I think probably you all know about, but that's a glass ionomer filling um, using only hand mixing and no electric instruments, as well as extraction. So originally it was just that, but we've since added silver diamine fluoride and fluoride varnish. And we also have a referral system set up with a hospital in the city for higher care. And the health workers that are trained in this have the same, a minimum same qualification as the primary health care worker who staffs the dental clinic, like the, the highest paid person in the government system at the rural level, but it's an additional provider. So one of the things that we learned along the way is that we, it didn't really work well for reasons that you'll see to just try to take a, somebody who's already busy with a full-time primary care job and teach them some extra skills. What, where we really started to get mileage out of this was when we brought somebody in with the same foundation qualifications and gave them the opportunity to specialize this and do it frequently and get really good at it and develop an identity in the community and a professional identity within the role of primary health care provider. Um, the other thing that I want to say about this is that the training that's initially given to, we call them dental technicians, so I'm going to call them dental technicians. I know that means something else to the rest of the world, but that's what I'm used to saying for the last 15 years. So we call our primary care providers dental technicians. And their initial training in, um, at least in ART and extraction, comes from the government for the most part. So the government of Nepal has been providing training in the basic package of oral care since the early 2000s. But what we can see is that there is no delivery of the basic package of oral care anywhere in Nepal in the public system. Um, the reason for that, what I would say, is that that training consisted of a few weeks of, of upskilling and then these healthcare workers are sent back to work in remote, limited resource areas with high levels of need, no professional support, no supervision, no access to GIC, no protocols for infection control or um, care delivery within the government health post. So what has tended to happen is that those providers who often have pharmacies or private clinics of some kind on the side, um, would just start charging for these services and delivering them in their private clinic. And then, you know, they might top up by learning some extra things like how to work with amalgam or do other things that they are not licensed to do. And that issue of um, 
of mid-level providers working outside their scope of practice has become a very large problem in Nepal. So I think that that is a fascinating kind of view if we think about the introduction that we had to this, like what are all the things going into that phenomenon and how do we respond when you have primary care providers being trained in something that's meant to serve marginalized rural populations who don't have access to care and then it goes awry, goes into private practice, breaks the rules, and then everybody's mad that, you know, it's the rules are being broken. Um, that's kind of an interesting phenomenon. So one of the things we have learned to do over time is to have a dedicated provider and then be doing a lot of things to support them. So you can see like a health post, this isn't a health post that's a traditional building, it's plastered, it's got a tin roof. Um, but among the things that we've added over time include working with a trained assistant, having a, a pretty rigorous um, clinic protocol in terms of the whole setup of the clinic, having a portable dental chair, having an extensive infection control protocol that's posted on the wall in Nepali where the public can see it. Um, we have a mentoring program, so new technicians are mentored by experienced technicians, we go in, we regularly supervise. Um, we've thought a lot about the environment. So some of you guys have been to the Caskey Coat Clinic. We've been able to get murals painted in three of the clinics. So like these places can just be kind of a downer. You know, it's like not a, not a welcoming building. Dental care is scary. So why shouldn't we make it pleasant to be in? There's no reason you can't bring paint, you know, and make the environment welcoming and give, people a sense of pride about the work they do. And um, that's part of what we could call being people-centered, you know, making this a place that people want to come and be a part of and don't feel intimidated by. So these have been very active choices. Um, the technicians all wear white coats that they've sewn, just really thinking about how we can make the environment feel respectful. And the last piece of that that's come in in the last few years is every six months we do a professional development and we've developed um, a competency log. So every year, all of the technicians have to pass a, a competency checklist. And that's a great chance for us to involve other stakeholders in this system, bring in dental professionals, um, help people feel supported so that they know that they are continually being supervised and that the quality and safety of their clinical procedures is something that somebody is is helping them to maintain and we actually provide a certificate for that and i have to that is one of a list of things that i could share that really has blown my mind in terms of the the impact that it's had on the providers how meaningful it is to them to be able to have a you know a certificate that says each year that they have passed this competency and we print their picture on it and it's like really important and really meaningful. So that's the clinic, that's part one of the program. The second part is not surprisingly a school brushing program, but as with the clinic, the title is simple. There's a lot that's gone in over time to thinking about how to make this float. It's hard to do school brushing programs. I think sometimes the idea is that like, oh, if we just go explain it to them, you know, then they'll do it. And nothing in the world works like that. It's really challenging to make these things get off the ground. Um, so some of the same concepts have applied. One is the role of the oral health coordinator. So um, when we're doing this, we're doing it in a whole village area. So every school picks an oral health coordinator and they kind of act as a cohort. So we do a training for all of them. We give them the title, you know, we make sure they can share their stuff on social media. We, whenever we, there's any like holiday or public program in that area, we tell all the oral health coordinators they should come. Like trying to really emphasize that as a, as something, as a role that means something. Um, the other things that we've added in recent years have been promoting schools to become junk food free, which I don't, this I think is one of the most challenging things. We have this great field coordinator um, who some of you guys got to meet, who's been working for us for about a year. Uh, his name is Sridhar and he has just, he has just crushed it this year. He's got probably about 
60% of the schools that we work with um, have either banned junk food and the kids have to bring snacks from home or they've actually started making snacks at the school. And the last part of what we consider to be part of the school brochuring program is a quarterly competition. So we use social media a lot for this. So the picture you see here is from a drawing competition. So we just kind of put the message out to all of the schools that are part of the, the program. And we say, we're having a drawing competition. Um, you guys run it however you want and we're gonna pick winners. And then we go and we pick some schools to, um, to be the winners every year or at, for each competition each quarter. So that's really the neat thing about that is that they we're, they're either directly able to share or we share these things on social media. So they kind of see each other being engaged with this. My favorite one that we've done so far was a music video competition during the Festival of Tihar last fall. So there's a traditional type of dance that's done every October, November during the Festival of Tihar. And we put out a call for Bilo videos on the topic of oral health. This is my plug for the YouTube channel. It's so cute, you guys. There's like kids doing traditional Bilo dancing with their toothbrushes, singing lyrics about oral health. It was, I think we got about 25 submissions. It was amazing. It was the first year we did it. So just trying to think outside the box about, you know, like it's not, it's a, it's a more, complex thing than just going and saying, this is good, everybody should do it. But how do we get people involved and, and feel, feel good about this and make it meaningful and feel part of community when they're participating in some of these things? Okay, so that's the school brushing program. Um, part three is school seminars. So this is basically your school-based oral health program. Um, you could, it's, it's part one of the outreach. So this is where the dental technician and assistant and the one uh, social mobilizer they work with as part of our program goes to the school and they do school-based oral health. So um, this involves a combination of classroom teaching, but these kids should be brushing their teeth every day at school anyway. So the oral health coordinator is probably doing this already, but it's a good opportunity to kind of get everyone jazzed up and bring a poster, et cetera. Um, and then they do school-based oral health. And this has a lot to do with thinking about kind of the school environment as an opportunity for accessing one of the most vulnerable groups in the population, which is going to be young children. And I wanna show you guys a short video now. I hope the sound will come through. It's about a one minute video and I have a series of them. This was actually at one of our professional developments, but this is our technician KP doing a caries risk assessment. And I'm gonna ask you all afterwards what you notice about this video as far as the interaction between these two. And you can see this is a busy room with five tables, five technicians working. Um, like, what's your impression of this environment? And tell me if the sound doesn't come through. Sorry, <laughs> that's not what was supposed to happen. Let's try again. Can you hear? So it's not in English, obviously, but just. So he's basically asking her questions about her oral hygiene habits. So if you kind of notice their body language, the other stuff going on in the room. So like, how does this environment feel to you guys? You can type your answers in the thing. Some of you may have done outreach programs before, been involved in, in camps. Like just kind of what's your first impression of, of what this interaction is like for that kid? Positive. So you notice how she's sitting up? I'm just going to back it up a little. Can you see how many kids in this room are sitting up? So they do actually do the treatment as well, but one of the things that we've really spent a lot of time on is 
you know, having an interaction with each child face to face while they're in a comfortable position, um, creating an environment that is not intimidating, the focus is on making the child feel comfortable at first. Exactly. So one of the things that's cool about having our dental technicians who are part of the community, the people who are doing this outreach are also staffing a weekly dental clinic. So they don't have to be in an enormous rush because they can refer back to the dental clinic. And this is an opportunity for them to be acculturating this child to having somebody look in their mouth, to helping them feel comfortable with this situation. Um, it doesn't always, usually there's only one technician in the room at a school, there might be two. Here there's five because it's our professional development. And most of the time, even with five technicians working, we're able to maintain this environment. But I can tell you, it, it can change like that. We had a situation in this very room the next day. I don't know what happened. The wind blew in the other direction. And the next thing I knew, this room was completely packed. It was loud. It was like pressured. And it's a really, once you get used to this, that is a whole different feeling. So I say that um, because I want to again, put this in the context of those different constructs that we're talking about. Like, what are we trying to do here? Yes, we care about this child's teeth. And we also care about the child. And we also care about building this system and having this child and her family interact with it over the course of a lifetime. And how can we think about all of those things within the course of this interaction that we're having with her? So that's the school seminar aspect. Um, so the fourth component of the program and the last is community outreach. And again, I think probably if I just said to you guys all right now, like when you picture a typical community outreach program in an environment like Nepal, um, like what do you, what kind of image comes to mind? Somebody tell me. I'm sure you all have a picture of that. What do you think would be occurring? We're gonna go do a community outreach with a mother's group in the village of Durali in Nepal. Like, what are we gonna do? And what kinds of things are we gonna talk about? I'm sure everybody has a guess. It's okay. You're not gonna be wrong. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna do education. What kind of education are we gonna do? Some screening. Oral hygiene instructions, yep. Exactly, so, and maybe do you think we might give out some toothbrushes and toothpaste? Yeah, so that's kind of the standard picture of what an outreach might look like in this kind of environment. And there are a lot of assumptions that are built into that approach, whether we've really thought about them or not. The assumption that people are unfamiliar with the concepts of basic oral hygiene. Um, maybe that they don't have access to toothbrushes and toothpaste. Maybe they've never seen a toothbrush. I have heard that before. Um, so this is a survey that we did a couple of years ago. I can't say this was, anyway, it was for internal program purposes, but we did survey 3,300 households. And 95% of people told us that they brush their teeth um, once a day or more. So all of the vast majority of those people told us that they used toothbrush and toothpaste. Um, about three quarters said that they could buy those products at a shop in their village and less than 1% said there was nowhere where they could get that stuff. Now I've spent the last 16, 17 years spending a lot of time in the environment of rural Nepal. This is not necessarily an accurate representation of what people actually do, but it is an interesting representation of what they know. So even if we were off by 20%, <laughs> you've got a lot of people who know the answer to the question, how often should you brush your teeth and should you use a toothbrush to brush your teeth? By contrast, this was another part of the survey. Um, people really weren't familiar with the idea of fluoride. So in Nepal, there's become the, the prevalence of unfluoridated toothpaste has reduced. It's actually been regulated a little bit more. Um, but 
when we started, there was this like powdery, spicy stuff that was really popular. Um, people weren't necessarily familiar with the idea that some kind of toothpaste could be much better for their teeth than other kinds of toothpaste. About half the people, this was in a place our project hadn't started yet, told us that they could get dental treatment at the health post where there is no dental treatment. So that's kind of interesting because what does that mean? Does it mean that people perceive antibiotics as being dental treatment? Um, does it mean that they've never gone to seek it out there? In any case, um, that's kind of something to, to work with. We find a fairly high uh, prevalence of worry that dental treatment could give you problems with blindness, mental problems, deafness. Um, we've hired people into this program to be in that social mobilizer team leader role at the community level. You saw the guy pointing in a classroom to the tooth at a school. We've hired people into the program who really strongly held this belief and we had to kind of deconstruct it. So you can imagine if, if almost a quarter of the population thinks that they can be blind if they get dental treatment, you know, if one person in your household is worried about that, then that's going to have an effect on how people utilize services. And strangely, 37% of people told us they get their teeth checked once a year. I, I've literally never seen that happen, but that's what the survey said, so I thought I should share it. Um, the truth is, in the best case scenario in most of the world, you're looking at a saturation point around 40 or 50% for this. So uh, that's not actually that terrible a number if it's right, but dental checkups are not really, preventative screening is not really a thing. So I share this with you because the community outreach is another area where I think over time we've tried to take something that seems obvious and break it down so that it's meaningful in the community where we're interacting. And this is another one minute video, it's subtitled. I have to say, I think this is one of my favorite ones um, just because of the interaction, the way that it takes something where you, you kind of expect to see one thing happen and let's see how this plays out and how Vidya approaches this. It's about a one minute video. Okay, so I see there's a question in the chat and I'll, I'll come back to that in just a second. But um, the reason I like that video is because she's not actually getting, she's, what she's gonna talk about as she goes through this is first of all, the school programs, the school brushing program. So that's not something that we sustain long-term. That actually has to be community finance. She's gonna work up to telling this group of mothers, by the way, your kids are brushing their teeth every day at school and how are we gonna make that work as a community? Um, she's gonna talk about fluoridated toothpaste. She's gonna talk about junk food and nutritional issues. She's gonna describe the different treatments that occur at the clinic. But she spends about 10, 15 minutes just having people talk to each other. She's not trying to explain anything to anybody for the first bit of this. She's just creating a space for people to bring out their own lived experience of this issue in their lives. 
And what happens is people start talking about how hard it is, you know, when their kids are misbehaving or won't go to school or demanding junk food, you know, like how hard is it to, to not give them money to buy cheese balls when they're at school and all kinds of things where you, you start to have an exchange with, that's it's kind of bringing out all of the, the knowledge that this group of mothers has about their actual everyday lives in raising their children and taking care of themselves. Um, it's a very different conversation than just trying to give them information um, that they may or not may or may not be prepared or able to implement on the basis of being told that it's a good idea. Um, I like to think of that as kind of like that, this video is the way it's sort of like tilling the soil, just kind of like getting everything ready to then place a seed and have the community be in charge of, of helping it to grow. Um, I see that somebody asked a question about social desirability responding in our survey. So just going back to some of these numbers that we saw before, um, I 100% agree that this is social desirability responding. These are higher numbers than I think are accurate in terms of what people actually do. The reason I share them here is because people gave us these answers. So it kind of puts uh, responsibility on us to think if 95% of people are telling me that they brush their teeth, is it a good intervention for me to tell them they should brush their teeth? Um, if 90, it's covered by your videos, but I think it's like 98% of people say they use a toothbrush, is it an effective intervention for me to hold a big toothbrush and show people how to use it? I'm gonna say it's not as effective probably as other things that we could do. Um, so that's, but I, to the person who asked that question, I, I think that that's a very valid point. Um, this doesn't necessarily represent how people are actually um, behaving in their everyday lives. And then the question is why? You know, if you don't have water running in your yard and you have to, if you don't have water in your house in a sink and you have to go outside in February, at night and go and dump cold water on your brush to brush your teeth, like maybe you just don't want to. Um, there's just so many different things that go into this. Okay. So again, just another picture of our community outreach. And um, normally, like I would love to have more dialogue about this, but I know it's hard in this format, but when you see this interaction in a community outreach, keeping in mind that that dental technician is the same person who's part of the community, like what strengths do you see represented here from a clinical standpoint, from a public health standpoint, and kind of from a social justice standpoint? So from a clinical standpoint, we know that outreach and is gonna give you a lot more opportunity for upstream intervention, um, being able to just get there earlier and not have to use as invasive procedures. From a public health standpoint, we could say that this provider is somebody who's part of a workforce that can deliver care that's targeted specifically at this community and this environment and this situation. And from a social justice standpoint, we could call this people-centered, kind of thinking about the needs and the experiences of this man in his everyday life and um, bringing the care there. So one last video I'm gonna show you. You guys are probably familiar with SDS. This is that same day, so during the screening. And um, this is our dental technician, Hira. And she did probably, I think she saw about 65 people that day. Um, we're in a community building. You can see the assistant there who's managing the infection control with the sterile and non-sterile area. And I, what I like about this video is it just shows how, again, kind of how, how undramatic um, this can be and how respectful and efficient, which I don't mean in a crass sense, but really just making it possible for people to participate in their healthcare. So that's kind of the four components of our model. Um, I like to present this as a human rights-based 
model for primary oral, oral health care uh, because it focuses on um, that aspect of self-determination. We are a little more tilted towards the social justice than the public health side of things. We focus on these structures, on developing the workforce, on the quality of care, on the advocacy. When we have to make a choice sometimes between um, something that could be really good if you did it all the time for everybody, but might not be something that we can build up through the system, we tend to choose the system so that we can always stand on two feet and say, this is something that is the public responsibility. This should be done because it's doable. Um, I'll just quickly show you guys a little bit of data from this year and then have maybe like five or six more slides and then we could have some discussion. So this is kind of interesting. Like, first of all, if you look on the left hand side, you can see that the majority of care occurs in schools. Uh, and then about 25% occurs in the clinic. So right off the bat, if we're thinking from any one of these perspectives, clinical, public health, social justice, if you put a clinician in the health post and wait for patients to come, then you're probably gonna miss most people. That 25% is coming even when we're doing the kind of outreach program you just saw where we only do topical fluorides in the field. We mostly refer, refer people back to come to the health post. The second thing you can see in terms of treatment distribution is a really heavy emphasis on the most um, non-invasive and preventative techniques. So between fluoride varnish and silver diamine fluoride, we have about um, two thirds of our treatment. And then another quarter is comprised of GIC. So between restorations and sealants. Uh, only about 6% of the care was extractioned. And we were able to refer over 700 people last year into, the, um, into a care pathway. So some of those were referrals back to the health post, but some of them were referrals to dental hospitals where it's you know, some number of those people would have been unlikely to go seek out that care without having a point of contact available to them at the local level. So here's kind of another way that you can see this from a similar perspective. So in the bar graph on the top, um, you can see, first of all, that um, the amount of topical fluorides is if you just look over, I can't, I don't, I guess you guys can't see the cursor, but if you look over on the kids side on the bar graph, oh, you can see the cursor. Oh, great. So over here, we have a nice gradient going from topical fluorides to sealants to ART to extractions. So that's positive that we can see that the majority of care that's being delivered is preventative and early interventive care. Um, we can also see referrals starting with adults and dropping down to kids. So when we did this stuff, we only referred about 5% of kids to higher care. So the vast majority of pediatric needs could be managed using this package of care locally in schools and at the health post without mechanized, without any rotary instruments, just using um, topical fluorides and GIC and a small amount of extraction. Um, you can see that teens overall get the least amount of mojo in this system, which is not surprising and just kind of some sealants going up. Obviously, we have most sealants happening in kids. I guess we sealed a few adults because why not? Um, if we look down here, this breaks things out by which treatments occurred in which setting. So extractions mostly happen in the clinic. And that makes sense because the people who are going to take the time to go to a clinic are be the, going to be the people who have an emergency, an acute need. People are much less likely to go to the clinic just for a general checkup, um, particularly in the setting where we're working. We can also see over here, oh, I can't see it, that the reverse is true of our topical fluorides. So the vast majority of fluoride treatments occurred in schools and less so in our adult outreach and even less so in the clinic. So again, if we wanna be able to deliver a high volume of preventative care, that outreach piece is really, really important. Okay, sorry, my, <laughs> I can't quite figure, all right, all right, all right, we got it, we got it. 
Okay, so that's pretty much our model. The last thing I want to talk about is the question of advocacy. We talked about that before. So because we take a social justice approach, uh, we want to be able to transfer what we're doing into a social advocacy piece. So <laughs> for us, what that has meant is <laughs> mobilizing leaders in the communities where we're working and stakeholders there to go advocate for themselves at higher levels of government. With our, we, we're kind of there as a broker and as an assister. Um, but the idea is not for us to go ourselves, but for leaders in the places where we're working to say, hey, this is really important and the rules should make it easy for us to do this, um, you know, for the, the people who we're responsible for. So these pictures that you see here are from a meeting that we organized last February, well, I guess it was a year ago, February now, for local leaders, um, health ministry people at the local level to essentially draft policy recommendations for the regional level of government. And we've submitted a lot of documents with these kinds of recommendations. So an example is the one that I have there. We finally started getting to the place where they're just calling us to come to the meetings because we've kind of like banged on the door so many times. But it, what's important about this is that you know, to, it's not about us just going there and saying what we think should happen. It's about using the work that we've done to collaborate with, with the communities where we work so that their voices are amplified and we are there to support that process. So here we are again. Um, I'm kind of coming to the end. This is the first slide that we looked at as far as the, the structure of the healthcare system in Nepal. But the thought I'll leave us with is if we wanted to kind of take these three ideas of clinical, public health, and social justice, and maybe in an idealized world have a wrapped up, you know, single way of sort of combining them all into the best of all worlds, we could think of that as essentially as quality of care. And I've listed here the quality of care guide from the World Health Organization. Uh, you could kind of more or less divide this into like the clinical pieces and the structural pieces. So clinical pieces of safety and effectiveness are highly sensitive to operator skill. Those things are happening right there in the setting between the patient and the clinician. Um, but these other things, even though they're all gonna be influenced by everything, these other things like whether the care is available in a timely way, whether it's an efficient use of resources, whether it's uh, equitably distributed, whether it's people-centered and welcoming and meets people where they need, those are basically gonna be dictated by institutions. You can have a super enthusiastic individual clinician and your most dedicated patient who wants to do everything right. And at the end of the day, as a society, if these aren't things that we're invested in, then it's gonna be very hard to achieve these aspects of quality of care. So with that, um, I have some discussion topics, but mostly I'm interested to hear all of your thoughts. And um, that's what I have for today. That was really interesting. I have a question. Um, for the population that has a stigma of dental treatment causing blindness and deafness, how do you go about deconstructing that idea? I think that is one of the things where we would simply just tell people that that is not a risk. What I would say in addition to that is like who is delivering that message and, in, and where and in what way is that message being delivered. So uh, in our case, when we do those community outreaches, um, first of all, we know that that's an issue so we can draw it out of the crowd. Um, we don't tend to just sort of name it. We ask leading questions until somebody brings it up. And then we get everybody saying, oh, is anybody else worried about that? And then everybody gets all excited about it. And everybody can kind of validate that this is, you know, a real worry and concern that people have. And then we're able to engage in a dialogue about that. But that dialogue is coming from a person who is also engaged in the school system in the local governance system, is running a weekly dental clinic, looking like a professional. Um, some people are still gonna be worried, but for the most part, I think when, when that is approached as a discussion, 
uh, in a in a respectful way okay. um, that can be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, so I also have a question. Um, so a number of them. Uh, with your group, can you like tell me more about how you handle these things financially? Um, I get a trend of you started something, uh, you know, with different approaches before you started getting government involved somehow because you wanted to maybe get things running and then hand it over to the community. So how? Like, were there financial burdens and how did you manage them? Yeah, that is a million dollar question, isn't it? So it was a long time before we could get the government to invest funds in this. And, and we have started to have some success with that. Um, but mostly it has run as a nonprofit model. So I raised the money for it myself, which is not what I thought I was signing up for when I started this, but that is what I do. Um, and then over time, we've been able to kind of work towards that process first in very small, almost nominal amounts of having the government invest in things around the clinic, which is what they're most interested in, and then gradually working into technician salaries. So now we have enough of this going that word of mouth, it's like, you can see it working over there. So now this place over here is much more interested in having this happen. So if we go to them and say, you need to set aside $500 for this year and we'll, do, we'll spend 4,000 or 5,000, they're much more ready to do that than they were in the beginning. And that is our model now as a co-investment model. So we don't need to just start more of these. Um, we basically approach it you know, more in that way. There were also some political changes that happened along the way where um, different things happened in the structure of the government in Nepal. And so opportunities came up where like new members were elected or some rules shifted or something happened that created a doorway. But it was because we had been standing there already like knocking that as soon as something changed, like the door went down and then, you know, we were able to kind of get in there a little bit. Um, but other than that, most of the funding is, is fundraised through a nonprofit model. And the long-term uh, target for this, what we would like to see happen is to have the health policy in Nepal allow for the dental technician and the, the assistant to exist as government full-time government employees, um, doing full-time, like staffing two or three clinics, and then full-time community outreach and school-based oral health, and that the government would pay their salaries and um, whatever medicines are already part of the essential medicines lift would all be financed by the government. But one of the things we've learned over time is that the component of like making sure matrix bands are in there and <laughs> you know supplying things well and the quality of care, some of the technical pieces I think we're a ways out from expecting that financing to come from the government. Uh, the idea there would be to hand that off to a larger agency that may not be, or a variety of agencies, which is what, you know, large INGOs can do this kind of thing really well. If there's a policy in place, they can provide technical support. I don't think they're great at innovation, but they're good at scale. So that's the kind of financing model that we've envisioned for the future. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and just a quick follow up. Did the people have to pay from start? Because uh, I don't know, I'm thinking as an incentive, maybe when it started, it was free or not? It's actually, that's a, a really astute question. So it's actually the other way around. When we started, people paid a nominal fee of anywhere from 20 to 70 rupees, which is like, at that time, it was about 50 cents to a dollar. For treatment and the idea was in fact to get community buy-in as we started to get a little traction even just a little bit of institutional traction we let that go it just didn't really make any sense because the rest of the government services are free we weren't retaining those funds they were going into a, a, an account to be able to support the clinic after we handed it off it was such a small amount of money and it was a headache and it just kind of you know, didn't really serve a purpose any longer. 
but some of our oldest clinics still do do that. They, they fundraise a little bit of money, like, you know, enough for some small amount of, sub, of incidental supplies every year through small fees like that, but it's really not financed by the public. Okay, uh, my second question, if nobody wants to go yet, will be, uh, so the concerns of the local dentists concerning, um, you know, having this pop up everywhere, how, how are you able to like put your technicians in check? Because um, this is a concern everywhere, I think, where, you know, technicians are trained for one thing and they get to their post and, well, if monitoring is not like strict, they begin to do things outside their scope. And that is why I'm sure like these dentists are concerned. So how do you uh, make sure your technicians stay in the scope of what they've been trained for and are not doing other things? Yeah. Uh, outside, yeah. So at the size and scale that we're at, we have generated a, a considerable amount of, I guess, kind of social capital and social monitoring. We're working in collaboration with the local government and the technicians have the opportunity to be in the government health post providing services. So it is in their interest to make sure that they don't mess anything up on the side or do something that might cause somebody um, to have some kind of um, ill effect afterwards. Number one. Number two, I think when you can I mostly approach this as a systems issue, not as an individual issue. So I think where we really start to kind of like get a headache about it is how do we make this person, you know, not take this action, not think this way, not want to do this, play by the rules. And our view is if you provide a, a transparent, high quality, available legal service, there's no reason to have a shadow service on the side that costs money and isn't regulated. And in, for the most part, that has worked quite well. We have run into some issues, um, a limited number of issues. And in that case, we engaged those social mechanisms. So we went to the local government and we said, you need to be aware that the person who's working in this clinic also has a separate clinic and is referring patients from the government health post to their private practice and earning money there doing things that they are not licensed to do. And we have a referral hospital. And that's a fairly powerful way to intervene because that, that person doesn't necessarily wanna give up the role that, that's available to them. If that role is well supported, if it's admired by the community, if they're being effective and useful, if they get to go to professional development, you know, those are a lot of, that's what people want in their work um, is to be able to feel rewarded and supported and useful. So I think if you try to expand that to a whole country, you're still gonna have people who do malpractice. But the question is at what point do you trade off? You know, do you, do you essentially cut it off and say, well then all 30 million people don't get any care at all because we don't want these people over here to color outside the lines. Um, I'm a big believer that you work from a strength perspective. You make the best possible thing available and disincentivize those other ways of working. And on the heels of that, I think there are plenty of licensed professionals all over the world who work outside of their scope. Um, you know, dentists who are, who are general dentists who maybe aren't actually very confident or competent in something like a surgical procedure but who will attempt it and do it anyway. And, and it is within their license scope of practice, but maybe it's not, you know, uh, their strength, maybe it's not their skill level. So I think that, you know, we, we see this and, and professional um, demeanor and ethics have a lot to do with that. Uh, you know, in our outreach programs, my pediatric dentists are very clear about their limitations on, you know, yeah, they went to dental school, they're licensed dentists, they learn to do procedures on, on permanent teeth and on adult teeth. And, you know, when I sometimes have to tap into them and say, hey, would you be comfortable coming and doing, you know, an amalgam on number 19, they go, you're kidding, right? 
uh, you know, and some of them will say, yeah, absolutely. I do those all the time in my practice. Um, and likewise, when I ask a general dentist to do something, you know, with a child, sometimes they're like, uh, uh, so I think it's really important that we trust uh, that people recognize their own limitations as well. Um, I mean, licenses and regulations are, are part of it, but I think that there's a, um, you know, professional um, ethics that we have to trust that most people, you know, work from that scope of doing the right thing. And yeah, it's, it's the minority who take advantage or who, um, you know, screw things up in some cases for the rest of the group. Uh, Tamarinda has joined us um, and she is currently working on a large project in New York City where um, we're training nurses, school nurses, to apply SDF and to do some basic um, oral health prevention in schools and has run into probably some similar challenges to what Laura has expressed right here in New York City <laughs> based on scope of practice and based on this, you know, this um, worry from various professions about what a health provider should and should not be allowed to do and what is and is not reimbursable even from the government's point. Tamara, do you want to share any sort of thoughts or reflections on the similarities that you see with this rural Nepal, you know, health post and New York City public schools? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, it's interesting that at the end of the day, a lot of these regulatory bodies are invested in, you know, supposedly providing care um, to populations, whether they be vulnerable or not. Um, and then the idea comes along to expand uh, capacity to include different procedures. Um, and you find yourself in a, in a place where, you know, oh, the law or the legal guideline says something like you can apply a topical fluoride. Um, and so, you know, we run with that and we say, well, SDF is a topical fluoride. <laughs> so next thing you know, we have, um, you know, the support of obviously a very large institution in um, trying to use the official language and documentation to carry the banner forward, but not without, um, you know, significant um, consideration and the potential of significant impact. I mean, um, in the example of my program, if nurses were to be proven to provide efficient um, and equitable care using silver diamine fluoride, just as any dentist, just as any dental hygienist would, then it would expand the workforce in the United States uh, to, to uh, 20 million people. You know, it's, it's, it's really incredible. Um, and so it, it's just, uh, it's funny how no good deed goes unpunished, I think is the similarity. <laughs> and I, I, I think it's so interesting to hear that because these are the places where, um, this is why I like to, you know, with, with the, this class last year as well, kind of come in through the lens of like these different vantage points and perspectives because those questions can really get very thorny and confusing at the individual practice level. Like when we say, how do we prevent a provider from going outside their scope of practice? But when you get to the public health you know, platform and you look back and you say, we could expand our workforce by 20 million people. Like it's just a different, then, you know, so then if some people are going off the rails, like it's a, just a different calculation, regardless of where you come out. And then we're working from the social justice perspective. So my answer to the question is, are people getting the healthcare they need or not? You know, do people have an option? And if the remedy to Joe over here you know, doing X, Y, and Z in Joe's private practice is that none of these people get any access to care, then we're grounded in our reasoning for why that's not a good trade-off. It doesn't mean that we endorse, you know, this other thing, but it's helpful to, to know the framework that, that, that you're using to, to try to, you know, work out the question because nothing is without its problems, you know, and when you make trade-offs, the question of who's in charge and who benefits is going to have a big influence on which trade-offs get made. And 
children in schools and people in rural Nepal and people in some of the communities um, where, you know, where you're working in New York, they aren't the people who get to decide which of those things matters more most of the time. And, and that's something for us to be, to be conscious of and trying to find the, the perfect answer, I think. Are there any other questions for Laura? Any comments or uh, responses to her questions that she had up there? You guys, how do you, how do you feel about mid-level providers? That's always a hot topic uh, and it will continue to be among your future colleagues. Anyone have an opinion either way? Feel strongly in support of or against a mid-level provider in any country. It doesn't matter if it's our own or, you know, Canada or uh, Nepal. Uh, I, I think there's arguments that, that there's... oh, sorry. What's that, Dylan? No, 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 I think someone else was talking, right? Or was it just me? I think you and Avia started at the same time. Oh, you can go ahead, Avia. Now you go. So um, a little bit about the mid-level provider thing, but I think also um, I'm definitely a highly in support of it. I mean, we have 4 billion people that um, currently are not being treated with, um, well, not having access to care, which I think is a large issue. Um, and even now with coronavirus and everything going on, you have 7 mil million people without, uh, 7 billion without access to care. Um, but I was wondering, and I've been thinking a lot about this lately in terms of what circumvents like us introducing SDF as a like at home type of thing, where essentially you have, I mean, cause I know that they sell like temporary cements, they sell stuff like that um, within, the, within the confines of like a Dwayne Reed or something like that, um, where they're able to apply it on the temporary and then put it back in the mouth in, in the event that it falls off. But you have 4 billion people that are suffering from this disease. And if it gets to a point where it'd be indicated to apply, I mean, basically if they have a cavitated lesion that has active decay, it's causing them a significant amount of pain. Couldn't we tell them to um, self-apply only in those conditions, SDF to arrest the decay and stop their pain? Uh, and I'll, jump even... in. I'll jump in and I'll say that um, generally the uh, this is a little clinical, but um, SDF would not typically be used to reduce pain. It's to stop the disease process for teeth that are asymptomatic. Um, so I think that's just a very specific. Uh, so if you have pain in a tooth, um, the application of SDF would not necessarily stop that pain. I can add uh, one other thing from a sort of perspective process standpoint. So I myself am not a clinician, although I know more about SDF than I ever expected to. Um, but our experience in working with our dental technicians is, has been that there is a lot of technique to work on with SDF. So it's, you know, there's a gamut that you can run from kind of getting it done to using it to maximum effect. And we're trying to be at the end of the spectrum of using it to maximum effect, all the way up through our last training was in use of full mouth SDF for high risk cases and in applications with older adults who are at risk of tooth loss and have had some kind of life change. So um, there are things that can go wrong. We've had any number of kids with very awkward looking stains on their faces, which is not awesome. Uh, but I think this maybe falls a little bit into that space of how do we take the things that are easily cast away as being kind of good enough or for, for people who can't get other stuff and move them into the category of this should be done excellently? Why can't people just be able to get it from a nurse, you know, or from these other access points where it can be done at a really good quality level? You know, should they have to do it at home? um that's that's what i would say i definitely absolutely agree with that i think in regards to um the earlier comment it's also about like as you said the optimization of the application 
where in certain scenarios, if you have a cavitated lesion that hasn't sort of, that has already cavitated, uh, you have access to the decay, you have access to the bacteria, and therefore you've arrested um, more effectively. The problem is when the lesion is incavitated and then you have no access to the underlying decay or the active disease process, that um, us as providers would go in and basically break the cavitate or expose the underlying bacteria and then apply the act actual um, SDF. So that's why I didn't really, I had a disconnect in terms of that. And I think in terms of you have decay going through multiple stages before it even gets to the, the pulp, um, and therefore, which would be the main main pain, um, or root canal pain essentially, or the need for a root canal, um, which I'm sure a lot of um, people are scared of. Um, so if you intervene before that point, so when it's cavitated, but not necessarily at the pulp, sticks an SDF in there, um, it, it, it just, I don't know, I can't, I can't see why a lay person, anyone, um, can't do that. And especially when this is the most chronic disease in the world, we all know all the stats. So I've had a lot of um, issue, I mean, even, even us, I know the black stain is an issue with posterior teeth. Um, even if you cover it with like a zirconia crown, it's opaque enough, you're, you'd be able to hide the entire thing. So there's a lot of questions about, as you said, the resistance that we're getting from dentists either locally or even worldwide. I'm sure you're not the first person to uh, to suggest or propose or uh, ruminate about self-application of these things. Um, and I do think that uh, that it's an interesting um, it's an interesting idea. But I also think that, you know, when you look at how long it took to get approved in the United States, whereas a, the substance had been used in other parts of the world for many, many decades before that, um, you know, our FDA, our process for controlled substances is very limiting uh, and very limiting of the ability to get, you know, medications that people need out to the population. Um, whether we, you know, really, whether they're harmless or not. Uh, and I think that the health professionals in the U.S. and especially the advocacy bodies, the, um, you know, agents who make those decisions are very risk averse because we do live also in a highly litigious society where, you know, if you can sue McDonald's for spilling hot coffee on your lap and win, um, you know, you put a bottle of SDF or, you know, a, a unit of fluoride varnish in someone's hands and they misuse it somehow, you know, it's, I mean, that's the unfortunate reality of, of the world that we live in. So I think that there are, while the, the simplicity of what you're proposing, you know, I, I can understand there's so many layers of, you know, of additional um, barriers to something that could theoretically be so simple. Um, it, it took us a really long time to get FDA approval and SDF. And while the rest of the world was using it and doing research on it and saying, look at this, it works, it works, it works. We're going, oh, well, we're going to have to, you know, wait a few more years and put that through our very long bureaucratic process. Dr. Stein, I think you wanted to say something. Go ahead. If you want to have the most effective use of, of SDF, you have to be aware that there is a specific technique that's required for the application of SDF in order for it to have its maximum efficiency. So if you want to have some people who are not trained at all, just applying it to the external surfaces of the lesions, you're not going to have the kind of caries arrested that you would if the protocol for applying SDF is followed. So that kind of takes it off of the over-the-counter use. The people who place it have to have a certain amount of technical training about the proper application of it in order for it to really work to advantage. Would you not agree, Tamarinda? Yeah, and I, I would say even like what, what I can add to that is that that process is an iterative process. It's not a, you know, gaining that technique is not sort of a one-time thing. No. So on behalf of the person who, who needs that treatment, I think it's worth us as a, as a, you know, as a society investing the time and making sure like, why should they have to do it at home if it's something that they should be able to get access to? And furthermore, if 
they have that specific tooth going on with that issue? What else is, you know, is going on with them? If they have the opportunity to interact with a primary care provider, then they're getting the care that they really need. Um, you know, maybe they need a whole mouth fluoride treatment. Maybe they need somebody to work with them on uh, various other lifestyle aspects. So, you know, we don't want to deny that chance by sort of being like, well, they can probably do it good enough, you know. Yeah, that, but that I mean, as, as you said yourself, I think that the, um, the reality of the situation is the problem for them, whoever's suffering from this issue is now. It's not tomorrow, it's not a day after. There's still four billion people and no act of public policy at the moment is going to be able to alleviate the discomfort of all four billion people. And in terms of the conversation in regards to FDA approval, we talk about silver nitrate, which is the key ingredient in terms of the antibacterial effect that we see with silver diamine fluoride. And a substance like that, you have thousands and thousands of other um, drugs that are available over the counter that can still result in that adverse outcome. But we see compliance in terms of patients, in terms of they follow the instructions and the directions given to them on the back of the box. So that has to be, I don't know. I see, I still see a lot of issues with it and nothing I don't think said um, sort of overrides that. And yeah, optimization of the application is important. Yeah, they deserve um, the best care. Um, but the truth is they're not getting any care. They're not getting any um, solve or resolved uh, their pain. They're living with this pain and nocturnal dental pain is known to be one of the um, worst pains ever. I've, I've went through it. I, I can't even imagine having to deal with that with no, um, no option. What, what are you what are you going to do? Are you going to take a flight somewhere? I and mean, you can't you can't afford that. There's no dental um, care. I think there has to be at least an option other than waiting for the tooth to die and eventually falling out. I mean, it's I apologize for getting so uh, defensive about it, but I, I do feel strongly about the fact that so many of these regulatory issues um, sort of. I think the problem is us. The problem is not anything but us. And that's, that's sad. Well, I would agree that if there should be other solutions. Um, and along those lines, that they should be structural solutions. They should be embedded within the access to health and, you know, the ability for people to, to access the resources that they need to stay healthy. Part of that being a workforce, a health workforce. Um, the uh, the issue, you know, again with pain, SDF doesn't doesn't take care of pain, so it prevent pain. Though I get that it doesn't take care of pain, but it would prevent the progression of active caries to the pulpal, like to the depth of pulpal exposure, which would result in that pulpal pain. So Dylan, sure. I think I think I want to challenge you a little bit to think more about um, what what is what is what Laura is trying to get at and what we're trying to push for is an idea of how you help people achieve health. And I don't want you to get caught up on this idea that access to X will achieve that result because you can make that X anything. It be, could be access to SDF, access to healthcare providers, access to, but as long as it's an access issue, um, you're not focusing on the larger structural um, issue, which is how do you improve the health of these individuals? And any singular entity uh, is not going to address that at a structural level. So um, I don't, I don't think it's a good idea to get caught up on the idea that if everyone could just get a little packet of, you know, single dose SDF in the mail, then everyone would be much better off. It would be a band aid, but not much else, because you're not, you're still not addressing what we teach you at the college to prioritize, which is how do you address the fact that this is an active disease process and that the cavitation is simply a symptom of that disease process? Are you changing anything else about the individual's life or the influencing factors that um, led to that disease process? If not, then SDF might solve the issue in an acute fashion. Um, but I think what Laura has really been pushing to think about is structurally how do you build a um, whether it's a community or a culture 
that prioritizes the pursuit of health. And I'll, I'll take it one step further, which is back to the thing I said at the beginning. If we're talking in the clinical column without accounting for the other columns, then when we act over here, in what ways can that reinforce a system that actually is self-perpetuating to ensure that people are gonna continue experiencing disease and suffering? So if we make it possible, let's take this to the extreme. This is kind of a neat, like imaginary effect. Paul Farmer writes a lot about this kind of stuff. I shared one Paul Farmer article with you. If we make a kind of good enough thing, you know, that's, that's sort of, let's say, let's imagine that it's quick and it's easy. I'm not sure that it is for a lot of the reasons that have been brought up, but let's imagine that we could make this home remedy possible. We know it's kind of, not as good as doing it the, the more high quality way, the right way with a, a trained provider who can use it to maximum benefit more safely and address the problem more holistically, but we sort of do it in this other way, then how, what does that do to a system that doesn't seem to be able to invest time and energy in making that healthcare provider available to that person so that they could go and and get the care that they actually needed. And there's a, a lot of literature on the ways that these kind of in, interventions actually serve to perpetuate the status quo. And we saw that in Nepal with the initial BPOC training. So the government spent a decade training primary care providers to do loose extraction and GIC fillings. And all that did was undermine that entire system, move it into private practice, and cause a huge political problem um, to try to shut down those services altogether. And the end result is that nobody <laughs> who needs that service in the primary care system has any access to it all. So it basically reinforced the status quo situation, whereas if we had said, we need to take this to the next level and make sure these people really have you know, very good training and they have all of these supports, then that, you know, that would potentially have led to a different scenario. So they are hard questions, um, but I, I agree. I encourage all of you guys to try to not get pocketed in one of those silos, but think when I'm over here, like what's the effect that that's having on how these different pieces interact with each other? I don't yeah, know. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think the overarching goal, all efforts always have to be focused on um, making sure that we prioritize um, their understanding and also our ability to provide them with providers, with healthcare providers, and sort of create that on like a, a, a larger level. I just, it's, I I, I don't, if, if I ask, if I ask you the question, do you think within your lifetime, the, these 4 billion people that currently have care, I mean, don't have care, would you be would, like, how much of that four billion do you think you'd um, effectively be able to implement um, something like that, where you'd be able to provide them with care, like with this overarching goal of this um, dental providers for all type of thing is what I'm sort of grasping. Like how much of that four billion? Thing. I think if you want to get all four million people, you need to go to the social justice column. Which, and just in terms of um, the individual impact that you're having as a provider, if you, if you enter into every relationship that you have with every single patient with you ha that you have, practicing evidence-based dentistry of caries management by risk assessment, that doesn't just affect that patient, that affects that patient's household. And that's where you get the kind of change that is, an, is systemic change that you're trying to affect through all of these other columns that Laura described. You know, you're not just trying to treat that child or that adult with the silver diamine fluoride, you're trying to change the behavior of what they do, what they eat, how they view their oral health, how they view their oral overall health, and the access is on the other end. But the, the, the management of it is on the front end. Yeah, I mean, this is all based on the assumption that yet this is going to act as some negative enforcement in terms of um, no, how no, they do that's, that's not but presuming it's an assumption. 
it's not presuming that at all. It's just putting it in a different, a different place in the sequence. That's all. That's all I'm. That's all I'm inferring. Is that it's a different place in the entire uh, health system sequence of of how you affect change. Just so, and I actually would, Dylan, to some degree, I would stand by that. I would say there is a way in which um, we can undermine the more just vision of things by taking half measures. I agree with that, but I mean, then you focus your efforts on ensuring that that doesn't happen. You, you really educate about, hey, this, yes, you're gonna have the um, idea that because of the introduction of this, you don't have to care about your dental health anymore, but the reality is this prevention is much better. You don't get black stains on your teeth. You don't have to deal with all these things. Um, and the ideal situation is for you to take care of yourself, but this is there um, for the purpose of alleviating your pain in the worst case scenario. And respectfully, like I understand that, but in regards to a widespread implementation of a self um, application type of SDF product that's safer, um, but still retaining that therapeutic value, I don't see, I haven't, I haven't changed in terms of my idea based on what I've heard so far. So I just want to make sure that I still get a chance to hear Afia's question. Um, Dylan, I don't know what your final assignment project is, but I think you should totally do it on this and look at the question of self-applied SDF from the clinical public health and social justice perspective. That is, that is my also, dream also for you. One, one last thing. They actually <laughs> recently reported a study that showed that even the way we provide dental care, Recurrent caries is one of the biggest things that affect um, dental providers even in America. And when you apply this, it chemically arrests the bacteria to the point where recurrence is actually less likely than us picking up a drill and mechanically debriding the tooth. So it calls into the question, should dentists even be picking up the drill or should we really just break the cavitation, put some SDF, put an opaque crown over it, at least for the posterior um, teeth. But anyways, Afia, you can uh, take over. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, and I'm sorry if I screwed anything up. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, so it w it was a question you asked, and I think we were both trying to answer, so it's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Eddie, we have about 12 minutes left, um, and I know that Marissa, I think, was going to answer some of the strengths questions. So um, I just want to give a big thank you to Laura for joining us. Uh, it's always a pleasure. I think I've heard you present to us now three or four times and I learn something new every time. Um, so we love having you and I love being able to bring in leaders like you who, you know, have gone from um, a totally different background and, and tried to make change in the world and sort of came full circle to um, be able to very amazingly be a leader in, you know, this social justice movement that happens to have started with oral health in your case. Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your time again, and we hope to see you soon. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. I always, I just so enjoy the opportunity to get to have these discussions and interact with you guys, and it's just so much fun. Um, I do have one <laughs> request, which is, our guys in Nepal have been working so hard on this YouTube channel. And if you would be kind enough to go to YouTube, search Javaya Foundation and subscribe to the channel. First of all, there's very cute music videos of Bilo dancing about oral health, which I'm like, right now. we're all on lockdown. You all need that right now. <laughs> but honestly, even if you never watch it, if you just subscribe, or um, if you really want to get real, you can do what I do, which is just, hit play all, turn the volume all the way down and lead, let it play all day and help us rack up viewing hours. Because Sridhar, um, a couple of you have met Sridhar, he's our education field officer who runs like those competitions and stuff. He's just a really dynamic guy. He has got to be in his bonnet that we're going to hit a, the required thousand subscribers and 4,000 viewing hours in a year. And then he's like, we're going to make money off of YouTube. Now, I don't think we're, I think when you make money off of YouTube, it's like, four cents a month, but he's really motivated and I want to support him. And um, that's my request to you all is to subscribe to the YouTube video. And then if you want to be like next level, 
just let it play <laughs> on me. But really, if you just want to subscribe, I would be eternally grateful. I also um, have my email address on here. I'm, I hope I'm a fairly friendly person. I would be um, delighted to hear from any of you about questions about Nepal or whatever. Um, and I also put my blog up there. I blog about Nepal in general. I've spent a long time living in rural Nepal. So I try to have a sense of humor about the funny things that happen when you take this rando liberal arts chick from Maryland and then stick her doing dental care in Nepal. And hopefully it's entertaining. And then also I've put some different reading in here so I can send this list. I don't know if you'll have the video, but in case anybody's interested in some of these topics or if they would apply to any research you're doing, that's also something I can correspond about by email. And thank you guys all for having me. This is really, really enjoyable for me as well.